Hey guys, this is Shelly from Wild Village Farm. Welcome back. I have a very exciting video for you guys today. This is probably one of my favorite videos because if you've watched any of my other videos, you know that I love to give book reviews. I love to read. I love to gather knowledge. I love to share knowledge. Um, I have been working on a book that I've been writing. And so all of my reading and all of my researching and devouring of information, I have been able to narrow down to my top resources that I want to be able to share with you guys. Recently, my favorite YouTuber, Jessica Sowards from Roots and Refuge Farm, put out a uh, request for collaboration from other homesteaders and gardeners and farmers asking for your tried and true resources. And I thought, goodness, not only is she my favorite, she's asking me to talk about my favorite thing. So I wanted to share that with everyone. And I do have a list that I recently shared at my gardening workshop of my top 10 gardening resources that I, I want people to be able to access. And so I thought I've already got my list. And then I realized I have more of a list because I have vermicomposting, composting, all of the things. So um, I hope that this is helpful. I'm going to try to get through it quickly, but with as much energy and information as I possibly can to give you guys. And I just really am looking forward to feedback as far as what are your favorite books? What are your favorite resources? Some of them are online. What sparked this conversation was Jessica was talking about how AI has become so big and just, it's almost, it could be a monster. It, it could be good or bad, but what we're seeing is people are using AI to create these resources that we think are going to be helpful, but potentially could be dangerous um, or not helpful. And so what I was thinking is, just like she said, when I was listening to her talk about this in a podcast and in a video, she was talking about how, how, how do we know we're getting the right resources? How do we know we're getting solid and good information? And I've always been one, this is actually what I do for a living, um, outside of homesteading, I actually am a researcher. I'm a nurse policy analyst. So I take all of my background from nursing and I put that into researching and looking at policies that are being written and, um, and benefits that are being written for insurances. And so the reason I do that is to pay our bills, but also to provide the health care and the insurance that our family needs. So that's how I help provide for our family. But it's using a skill that I learned in college. I have a master's degree in nursing. I have had to go through many a classes on research and evidence and looking at things. And so asking the hard questions of why are they writing this? What is the motivation? What does this person get from writing this or putting this information out there? And that's why you see so much controversy right now in society is we we see people who literally just grab at any information they can get. And that has to be truth because I saw it on Facebook. I saw it on Instagram. So and so put it on Twitter instead of going, is this a reliable resource? And so I want to compile a list for you guys. I know that there's multiple other gardeners and farmers and homesteaders that are doing this right now and putting together a list. And I'm, I'm just interested to see how many of these books come up on their list. Um, I will put out there, I'm not putting any of Joel Salatin's books on here. Um, that's a given for me. Um, I am still slowly collecting and putting together a library of books from him just because I do feel like he has been a pioneer in a lot of um, homesteading here, especially in the United States. And, and I know that he, he not only does it here in the United States, I know that he goes across the world. He goes into Africa. He goes into South America. He has researched and worked in other places to help develop homesteads, to learn skills, to teach skills, and to grow places. And so I, um, if I can say anything, definitely start there. Some of his uh, information can feel a little overwhelming. At first, I, I joke with my husband, I'm like, I love his books, but I have to take it like a few pages at a time. Uh, usually it would be a nighttime reading, a couple pages because I have to chew on them. Like I will read them at night, I will chew on them the next day, and then when I'm ready to get past what I just processed, then I would go on to the next thing. So some of these books are not like that. Some of these are going to be books that are just perfect resources. You're getting ready to plant um, certain vegetables, certain fruits, uh, trees, 
stuff like that. Those are going to be resources for you to go back to over and over and over again. Um, I am going to put a couple of books in here that I absolutely love just for encouragement. We are in a hard season right now. I currently have a calf that's down. Not sure if she's going to make it. I've got a rooster that needs to be put down. Um, actually needs to be put in soup because he keeps attacking us. And I've got um, cows on other property because we do not have infrastructure at our new farm yet. And so there's a lot going on. And so I would highly encourage a couple of these little books just for if you're in that season where you need that extra boost of encouragement. And so those are going to be in our in our review as well. So I just hope that you enjoy this and it can be um, helpful and you can glean something. Even if you just start with one book, if you go, oh, that one looks good or that one speaks to where I'm at right now, do it. I had uh, two students in my last garden class who are in the middle of trying to remodel a house and buy land several hours away so that they can start homesteading in the next year. And we talked a lot about, okay, so you're in the learning and the waiting phase, but that doesn't mean that you are in the I'm not doing anything phase. And so the resources that I gave them, one is more for inspiration, but also for them to start taking notes and going, ooh, that sounds like a good idea. Ooh, that would work for us. Or, you know, developing their infrastructure, getting a plan, getting their two, three, five-year old plan, together. And so for them, the book they start with is going to be different than the person who's already established and maybe is like trying to decide how do I take it one step further? How do I grow more food for my family? How do I learn how to grow where I'm at specifically? Because we've just moved to a new place. Um, how do I move into fruit trees and, and a berry patch when I've never done that before? How do I move into cut flowers? everyone's in a different place. And so I am really excited to present all of these to you because um, honestly, this collection of book, books represents the last 20 years of my life over the different phases and stages that I've been in from being um, just a young college student to being a single mom of two children, uh, to being a full-time working single mom, to being a a mother of five and now I am at the end of that where I am still the mother of five but my nest is very quickly emptying and the next year we will only have one child left at home and so I, I, I I'm just really excited to share these with you so hang on grab your cup of coffee or tea sit down and we'll get through this together So before we start, one of the things that I want to say is I am 41 years old. We started homesteading about a little over three years ago in 2020, early 2020. Um, I am a mother. I am a nurse practitioner. I'm a nurse. I am a wife. I am a daughter. <laughs> I am a milkmaid. I'm a gardener. I am a chicken mama. Um, now I'm a turkey mama. I love raising birds, the ducks, the chickens, the turkeys. We had a goose. I don't recommend it. Uh, <laughs> this, this life has been good to us. I am not in a production um, for home setting sort of way right now. We are growing food for our family. We are growing food for um, the people in our home. My mother-in-law lives next door. Uh, we've got friends locally who, um, who do come and eat from our farm and we're just figuring things out eventually. Uh, yes, I think we would like to do things that would provide for us, uh, a little bit more than what we're doing now on a business scale. But right now we are trying to figure out where, where we're going with that. So, our biggest priority, before I get into all of these books, our biggest priority is growing food for our family. So <clears throat> the way that we've done that is through growing a garden and learning how best to grow a garden and learning how to grow a garden seasonally and how to eat seasonally. Another thing that we have really focused in on, we do have beef cows. We have a very small beef herd. We have dairy cows. Um, we have one that is in milk and that is bread. Uh, we have another one that we're pretty sure is bread. Kind of a long story. 
and we raise chickens, we raise turkeys, we raise ducks. Um, we eat the eggs, we raise meat birds for food. We have two turkeys right now. Uh, their names are uh, Fluffy and Scruffy, but really I call them Thanksgiving and Christmas because that's when they will feed us. Um, this is this is our story. You know, we I don't have a true mentor that has walked me through steps of homesteading. I have had to do the deep dive of research and learning. And so I am going to introduce you to books that have been what I call gateway books, books that I recommend for the beginner, uh, that I feel like there is solid information and that it is a stepping stone or a jumping off point. And I feel like everyone needs those. And so I hope that that's helpful. Some of these are also really, really solid resources, um, especially in the gardening world. They're resources that I go back to over and over again uh, with with the cows and with the chickens or the birds. Um, a lot of times I'll have to go back and kind of go, okay, we're, we're at this point, what are we gonna do for this? And, um, and then as we're learning and growing, trying to keep records and remember, this worked for me, this didn't work for me, this is working for someone else, and having a community where we have conversations and talk about things about our successes and failures, and having the ability to be open and um, real with one another. I appreciate transparency, but I also appreciate being able to be transparent in a safe place where someone will listen and follow through with good information. Before we go on. Also a given, Jessica. First time gardener, <laughs> growing vegetables. I needed this book. Um, it was extremely encouraging. Like I said, this is a given. This is a book that I tell any of my friends, I have friends all over the world because I did work for 15 years on post at Fort Hood, now called Fort Cavazos here in Texas. And so for 15 years, I met people that were coming and going in the military, families of soldiers, soldiers themselves. And so I've spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time talking to people in different parts of the United States, but also in different countries because they do get stationed elsewhere for several years at a time, asking me where to start. And this is one of the first books that I tell them. It's easy to read, it's fun to read, it's easy to follow along, it helps. It's a great guide. So, of course, this book, Miss Jessica. I want to share with you the book that in 2020, when COVID hit, we were set up, we had just bought a 16 acre little farm. We had no animals, we had somebody running their cattle on our land. We had no, no garden, no chickens. We moved in uh, six kids. We had an extra kid at the time. We moved six, six kids into this big, beautiful house. We had a 3,200 square foot home, 16 acres, out in the middle of nowhere, 30 to 40 minutes from the nearest store. And COVID hit, and the kids were all gonna be at home, and I was still working full time. My husband runs his own business, and there we were. And I was struggling to be in the middle of all of this. As a healthcare provider, I was a nurse practitioner. I was going in daily to take care of patients. My family was still at home. And with six kids, I would go into the store to buy milk or I would go into the store to buy food and we were limited. Our family of eight was limited to the same amount of food as a family of two or one person. And so that really was eye-opening to us, not just the empty shelves, but the ability of our family to actually gather and access food is kind of scary. Um, Luckily, it all worked out. Uh, it was a team effort and we were able to have enough food. We were able to be very creative and, and, and kind of do some things differently. But in that season too, there was this pressure for me of you need to learn how to grow food. I'd been learning my whole life. I've been following my grandmother around as a child. I've been following my dad around as a child. So it's not like it was a brand new idea, but my friend called and said, hey, we've got seven chickens. My friend thought she could have them. She has an HOA that says, absolutely not. They need a home. And we went from there. We immediately started building a coop. So these free chickens turned into 
uh, very expensive chickens because we built them uh, the Taj Mahal for chickens uh, because we didn't know how to do this life. <laughs> and we wanted everything to be pretty and we wanted it to be Pinterest perfect. And we spent a lot of money. We wasted a lot of money. We didn't know what we were doing. So in that season, um, in my faith, it was this just audible voice of, you will learn to grow food. And at the time, it just felt like, how? I'm working 50 to 60 hours a week. We've got all these kids. How am I going to learn to grow food? And it was just one step at a time unfolding. But this book, Shay Elliott, this is my gateway book. <laughs> this is, this was my gateway drug. And it started with just reading it, the pictures. I am a photographer. That is my other side job. My other side hustle right now is uh, Wild Village Photography. That's what I do. I take pictures of families. I love to take pictures of families with their animals. I love to take baby pictures. I am a newborn lover. Any great photo. And this book just captivated me. It In 2020, this was the book that I would just devour. I would devour the information. I remember at one point in 2021 getting angry that I couldn't have a milk cow. Like my lifestyle with the amount of work that I was doing with the kids, we couldn't have a milk cow. I, I, I really wanted a pig, but I wanted a milk cow. And um, at one point I actually had to stop reading this book and just put it down because I was so angry. But tons of great information, tons of just first timer exposure, uh, giving you ideas, the goods, the bads, the ugly, uh, Shay just does a fantastic job of writing. I always, I'm really bad. If You know if I've read a book because there will be dog ears on every page that I love. Um, but just going back over and over and over, it is 2023 and I still go back through this book, especially on days where I feel like, what are we doing? This is a great, fantastic book. So Shay Elliott, Welcome to the Farm, How to Wisdom from the Elliott Homestead. Um, that was my gateway book into homesteading just in general, where I felt like we could do this. Not long after I read this book was when I found Jessica Sowards and Roots and Refuge Farm on YouTube. And that's when I started following and asking questions and, and being challenged uh, by Jess. And so that's when I, I pre-ordered this book. I was so excited. And then I pre-ordered it for my sister too. It was, I think it was a Christmas or a birthday present for her um, as soon as it came out. Okay, so past my two gateways. I want to talk to you about something. This is a very specific book for Texas, but it's very helpful because Texas is a humongous state. And so if you're a Texas gardener, I highly suggest this. The only thing that I would do differently in this book, and that's because I try to use more um, organic fertilizers. I try to use things that are going to feed the soil, not just feed the plants, is um, when he talks about the type of fertilizer that he uses for the different vegetables um, and fruits. I find the, um, what is the word? I try to find the the type of organic fertilizer that's going to fit that need um, instead of using the 10, 10, 10 or, or whatever fertilizer that he suggests in here. That's the only difference, but it, very helpful, especially because there are so, even within Texas, we have multiple growing zones, um, being able to figure out what works best for you and realizing, oh, I've been doing that all wrong. I've been planning at the wrong time. Um, has helped me to figure out that I'm not actually as bad of a gardener as I think I am. Uh, postage stamp, vegetable garden. I check this out from our library constantly. <laughs> I need to buy it. Uh, but it's at the library and it's free. I use this a lot in teaching because so many of the, the students that I have are growing in smaller plots and I want them to understand you can plant intensively and grow a very large amount of food in a very small amount of space and so this has been really helpful it talks about vertical gardening it talks about square foot gardening but uh, a friend of mine when they were living in Virginia she said that that was the most prolific garden she has had and I want to say it was in like a 10 by 10 square foot garden space she did not have a whole lot of space and grew the most food she's been able to provide for her family um, uh, this book, High Yield Vegetable Gardening, also helpful, Colin McCrate, Brad Holm, um, lots of really great information, and they talk about size and space and different types of plots, and I really appreciate them because they also talk about how much time you as a gardener have to put into gardening, so I thought this was a really stellar resource. 
I want to say they have another book that's come out here recently. I have not gotten my hands on it. I think I saw it at Barnes and Noble though, so it's on my um, it's on my wish list. My older sister sent me this, the Four Season Vegetable Garden, or the Four Season Food Gardening, and this little young lady, she does a fantastic job again. Great pictures, great explanations, talks about harvesting in all of the seasons. She's in the Pacific Northwest. So some of, um, some of the things she does is very specific to where she lives, but there is a ton of people growing in that area. I highly recommend this. Not a thick book by any means, and it's a really great book for the first timer um, because it is like Jessica's book. It's easy to read, easy to follow. Um, the organization's a little bit different, so I feel like I got each of these books I'm getting different information from. This book I ordered, I'm not gonna show you who it is, The Family Garden Plan. I went into the library and saw this and thought that's really cool and I started reading it in the library. I couldn't put it down because I was so excited about how she has organized this book and what she teaches in this book. This is Melissa K. Norris. Um, Melissa is also a YouTuber. Love, love, love her. She's very organized. I feel like everything she does is perfect. Um, she's just an incredible homesteader as far as what she's doing and what she's teaching and that's from lifelong learning from even her childhood and I feel like her her gardening techniques and the way that she explains things is just really simple to follow she does tables and charts and so if you're one of those people that really likes tables and charts and that kind of organization um this would be helpful for you I like tables and charts to an extent um but then I kind of out of my head get a little more whimsical and go all over the place but um the information in here again from this is really good beginning to intermediate she's got really great information in here for gardening uh, the mini farming bible brett markham this is another book you're going to see all my dog ears over and over and over again um this he is very specific in what he teaches in this book, but it's very, very helpful. And I found it to be um, a really great purchase. <laughs> it was $8. I think I got this at Tractor Supply one day when they were having a book sale. But I have, again, read this. This has been a resource I've gone back to over and over and over again. So um, highly recommend it. And I'm trying to think. He's got a little bit of everything in here, but I feel like it was... It was helpful to an extent of getting started because I sometimes when I'm getting started, I feel like I, I, I just don't even know where to start. And um, and he did a really good job. This is probably a little more intermediate um, of, of a reading, but totally worth it. Um, Elliot Coleman. <laughs> oh, this I bought his 35th. Uh, anniversary edition because I wanted to know what he said has changed in his 35 years. And so this is intermediate to a little more advanced. He has some incredible information. If nothing else, if you are in the waiting and you are not in a moment where you can start doing all the things, start taking notes, just start reading his information. As you get further into the gardening rabbit holes, you're going to realize, oh, he mentioned that. Let's look at that. Um, I do not have a Charles Dowding book. I know that he's another one that people really highly encourage. I have been diving into the rabbit holes here with Elliot Coleman for so long that I haven't even had the chance to really step into what Dowding's doing. But I feel like they both have so much information to give to us and solid, tried and true. These guys are not newbies. They've been doing this for a very, very long time. And they can kind of share with you their failures and their successes and go from there. So one of the things that we're implementing this year is uh, some crop rotation, cover crops. Um, I'm, I've really been working hard to do no-till gardening and very minimal till gardening. And so I this was kind of my starting place, which again, this was a gateway into... The Living Soil Handbook and Jesse Frost... This guy, um, again, someone that you can read, someone you can mostly understand what they're talking about. I've had to go back over and over and over again. More dog ears. This is a library book from the Temple Library. Um, 
In fact, they called and said, please return the books that you keep borrowing over and over and over again. But this book um, is another one that's on my list. I will be purchasing this one just to have the resource available constantly as we're getting our soil together. Remember, we just moved here last year. I just started the garden bed in October. We just moved into the house technically in July. So our first garden bed went in in October and that was dry, clay, nothing soil that now we've been building up and this book has been a huge contributor to that on how to do that correctly, how to do that well, and how to do that to feed the soil and the microbes in the soil so that we will have really healthy, strong plants and a really great harvest. And I feel like it's been helpful. So definitely solid, we'll, we'll purchase, we'll go back and do this one over and over and over again. This is our goal. <laughs> I've been reading this book uh, for the last two years, off and on. It is um, pretty intense, which is very educational, but it's intense. And my goal would be these food gardens and permaculture on a larger scale. Uh, right now, we're on a very small scale. But I just keep going back and going, well, how does that work together? How does that work together? And it looks at a lot of the, it's, it's a lot of like biomimicry, uh, where we're looking at how does nature do it and how should we be doing it to best utilize what nature's already doing. So I feel like this is a really solid book for that, but uh, as a beginner, you can read it. I don't know that you're necessarily going to dive in and do all the things at once, but I, I think as a beginner, you can start to pick the things that are going to work best for you in your season that you're in. Uh... I have basically went out all my homesteading books. Um, homesteading from scratch was a fun one. Um, I have, I went out every single homesteading book I have. I did get Justin Rhodes' The Rooted Life. This is another really great diving off book, uh, a great place to start. It's really easy to get caught up in the details and feel like you need to get everything right in the beginning. I just really appreciate Justin's transparency in this book where he talks about this is where we messed up. This is how we did it differently. And and I want you to hear him say in this book, you can you can learn from everything that you do and do it better the next time. And, and that's kind of where we're at. We're in year, uh, what are we in, year three? technically year three. And, um, so I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, still a baby in some areas and having that kind of encouragement to know that some of the people that I think are the greatest at this are, are just as big of failures as me in the fact that they had to fail to, to learn and move forward. So, uh, failing forward, but also just how, important this life is in the way that we invest in people and the way we invest in our land and that we're good stewards of our land and how we take care of our families. And this is not just my life. This is my family's life. And this is providing for them, teaching them, growing them as well as growing food. Okay. So that was the books that I have here at the house right now. <laughs> that was the books for gardening and homesteading. Uh, I wanted, oh, one last, one last thing. It has critters in it. Um, because I really do try to not use anything organic or otherwise um, to deal with pests, I, I really need to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I teach people because a lot of times what happens is we see bugs and we just think bugs are bad and they're not. They actually can actually be a great part of your garden. And so this book will help determine whether something's good or bad and also has some options on how to get rid of them, ways to deter them. I prefer deterrence over having to try to react and respond and um, take care of infestation, but hey, sometimes you have to. So anyways, this is a good book. Uh, Susan Mulvihill, um, Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, and this is another one. My son, we go through this book a lot. Um, he, he's my eyes. So he goes through and <laughs> finds the bugs and says, mom, what do we do with this one? Mom, what do we do with this one? And also what I appreciate is she has like, she has the list of all the bugs, but she also has the list of your plants and the type of things that you may 
encounter so that you're not having to go, oh, I don't know what that is. You can kind of look through and figure out, okay, this is cucumbers. These are the different types of pests that are probably going to be a problem. And then she helps you figure out what to do with them. So that's a bug book. Uh, my other favorite critter book is Worms Eat My Garbage, uh, How to Set Up and Maintain a Worm Composting System. This is vermicomposting. Um, we have multiple compost piles here at our house. Ben and Meg Holler at Holler Homestead and then Josh and Carolyn at Homesteading Family, both of them uh, do some really incredible videos on just basic composting. Um, what I love about Ben's is how he uses his chickens to help compost. And so we've utilized a little bit of both of those and that's been really helpful. But one of the things I've been teaching in my workshops is also about vermicomposting because some of the families that come here, they don't have land. They live in small little neighborhoods. Some of them have HOAs. Did you know HOA, some of them do not allow you to have compost bins outside. And so this has been really great because I've been able to teach and help them get started on um, smaller scale with their vermicomposting. composting. Like we're starting with 60 worms, not thousands of worms and learning how to create bedding and create space and how to create an environment where they can grow and feed and grow and feed and poop. And that has worked really, really well. But this was kind of our jumping jumping off point because eventually that 60 is going to turn into a thousand. They do reproduce. And so we've talked about how to expand from the small, the small worm farm that they're starting. This has been a really great resource. Um, and it's been around forever, like since the seventies. Yeah. Um, this is a 35th anniversary. I like things that are 35 or older, <laughs> apparently. So this this is the 35th anniversary edition, and I know I bought it years ago. Um, the original author died in 2005, and this was kind of a, a colleague, Joanne. So I want to say I got this. This was released in 2017. So more than 35 years. Two recent books. And I know this is not like, hey, I need solid information. This is The Dirty Life, Miss Kristen Kimball. I needed this book when I read it. <laughs> she is funny. She's a fantastic author. She is an intelligent human being. Um, the way that she wrote this book, like I feel like I'm there and so much of it I related to just with our story. And it just encouraged me because she talked about the ups and downs. She talked about the emotional, like what it takes. She talks about the relationship of her and her husband trying to do this life and her learning and coming alongside him and and him walking her through certain things but man um, just very encouraging funny um I didn't want to put it down I had to because we all have to sleep sometime but very good book currently in the middle of this one up Tunket Road um Philip again I, I think some of it's because he does also have that like philosopher mindset but he's extremely intelligent and so you're reading and you're learning and your vocabulary is growing but also you're relating to him as he's dealing with buying cattle that he plans to use for oxen and sometimes things just don't work out and then the emotional kind of offset of this life we do get very attached even if we try not to we get attached to our animals we get attached to the land we get attached to our plans um, we did attach to the people and I'm at, I'm at a spot in here where he talks about how interdependence trumps independence every single time. And that is a place that I'm at right now when I'm having to do stuff here on our farm and I need help and I don't know how to ask for help or I'm afraid to ask for help or I don't even realize I need help. <laughs> like we we get this mindset of I can do it myself. I'm going to do it myself. No, um, this book is beautifully written. It's also just a reminder to me that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to have help. It's okay to have a community and it's almost a necessity. Okay. It's a necessity to have a village and people that work together to help achieve goals because this life is not actually about self-sustainment. This life is about community sustainment and where we are in our community. This is going to, this is going to matter in the future when we're coming into how do we take care of each other? How do we work together for a common goal? Also from our library, <laughs> Grow a Little Fruit Tree, uh, and Ralph. 
I am in the middle of utilizing this book right now. We have purchased our pear tree. We have picked the site for our pear tree. We have planted our pear tree. And I am in the middle of using this book um, to kind of help me keep our pear tree small. And what is the word? Cooperative and accessible. So this, this book, I am in hopes of, again, buying this one. She has over 20 years of experience. This is someone who's been doing this for a very long time and encouraged a lot of people. But the idea, and I don't know if you can see the picture here, she grows small trees. And these are not dwarf trees. These are standard sized trees that she has cut um, and pruned to be something that she can work with on her own without having to get on tall ladders. And she still is able to have quite a bit of yield. So I would like to have a small fruit tree orchard. And this is really helpful to me. Um, another beautiful book. I have a dream of a cut flower garden. And this is a book I actually bought for myself a couple years ago. Ask me how it's going. We have had to move our garden space four times in three years. So this has not happened. This is on the plan and the goals. And this is a dream for me. Again, we're in central Texas. This is something I'm going to have to pick varieties and types that will do well here. And I'm going to have to pick very specific timing and um, beds for them to grow in. But if nothing else, on those nights when you need a little bit of a dream, the pictures in here are absolutely gorgeous. If you'll just, I mean, if nothing else, just read it. <laughs> just read the book. Um, all my favorite flowers it, from zinnias to dahlias to ranunculus are on here. And it's just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. So go for it. Definitely recommend it. I will keep on um, working on this until we are actually able to plant our own cut flower garden here at our farm. And it'll be for me, not to sell. My little guy... Paxton, my seven-year-old, back in the spring said, Mommy, I really want to have a fruit patch. And the more we talked about it, he really loves raspberries. I've never grown a raspberry. So we went looking, we went through the library, we went through different resources. And this is the book that we came up with. This is the book that has been the most helpful. We do get on our Texas A&M um, website here in Texas they do a lot of research. They do. They also do some developments and um, developing different cultivars that will last and be the most productive here in Texas. And their website is fantastic because that has helped me in the past be able to buy the right varieties for our area so that I'm not spending a ton of money on things that are going to not do well here. It can be dry. We've had a drought. It can be a lot, it can be very wet, it can be very hot, it can be very cold. And so I need something that's going to be hardy for our situation. And they give you a great list of what will work best here. And then this book, um, and we've checked this book out multiple times from our library. It will be going into our library as soon as I have the finances to add all 500 books to our library. This book has two basic authors. So the this work incorporates portions of the berry growers companion copyright 2000 by barbara l bowling and then this book is revised and expanded by terry dunn chase in 2014. so um this starts with the most basic simple information and then expands into more long-term the questions, where to plant, what to plant, how do I know what type, what do they need, when do I prune? And I love that it's not a one size fits all because different canes and different cultivars have different needs. And this book does a really fantastic job of going through that with you and helping you to ask questions. What I did was I took that information and then I looked at the cultivars that I bought and I went through and kind of researched what the needs were of that specific cultivar. So this is a starting point. It's not an end-all be-all, but this is a fantastic starting point for the beginning intermediate first-time berry grower. I highly recommend this. Um, I was going to say the family garden plan that Melissa K. Norris, I also, or she has her own website where she's got blogs and stuff like that. 
she does a fantastic job of teaching how to plant fruit trees. And so I used a lot of her information on how to plant our pear trees. And then, like I said, I'm using Grow a Little Fruit Tree in conjunction with Melissa's how to plant a fruit tree information. Um, but I think she's a fantastic resource, not just for that, but those are some things that sometimes I'll take this and that and try to put them together because it makes sense to me. Um, sometimes I have to trial and error. Some things that work well here don't work well other places and things that work well other places work really poorly here. So you'll get on and find, I, I try not to get into arguments with people. Um, one of the Instagrammers that I follow for their gardening, homesteading, um, and, and she uses the words, uh, more than organic or better than organic. And I just try to kind of just stand back and watch, but she talks about how mulching doesn't work for her and it's a bad thing and don't do it. And where we're at, that's like, I can't imagine gardening any other way without a, a, some level of mulching to help protect the soil from the heat, um, to help retain moisture. But for her, she's in a completely different grow zone. So keep that in mind. Anything that you're reading and you're looking at resources, where are they growing? Is that the same practice that would be recommended where you're growing? Same with animals. That's my next step. Okay, animals. One of the books I've rented, rented out, one of the books I've given out to a friend who is trying to decide what they wanna do about chickens. Lisa Steele has great resources for chickens. Um, she has multiple books. I know when I teach up at the schools, when I'm teaching about uh, chickens and hatching eggs and doing our incubator and hatching eggs in the classroom, one of the teachers has this beautiful kids book by Lisa Steele. But the reality is when I read it, I was like, I've learned so much from this children's book. So that by name, I don't have all of her books. And like I said, I've rented or I've, um, apparently I'm renting out books now. I have loaned out her, her book. Uh, to a friend, but I definitely, that's where I would start. She also is online. So Lisa Steele, S-T-E-E-L-E. -E -E. And she also has, it's not just chicken, like it's fowl uh, and not, not, not fowl. Like it's good. Um, sorry. <laughs> fowl, F-O-W-L. She has a really great book on ducks uh, that my son, when he, this is my seven-year-old son, when he decided, mom, I want to start raising duck eggs. I want to have ducks. Um, that was the book that he checked out from the library. And it's beautiful. When we first started after Lisa, this is a book, uh, The Joy of Keeping Chickens. And Jennifer, I can't say, Jennifer, I can't say your last name, McGessy. Um, she owns Fat Rooster Farm in Royalton, Vermont with her husband and son. And again, beautiful book, beautiful pictures. And she shares some of her ups and downs, but she also shares a lot about what choosing your breed, meat bird versus uh, layers, how to feed, how to house, blah, blah, blah. Uh, very helpful. It was kind of the full gamut. Like this was all encompassing for me. I highly recommend this one. Just let me see the picture for a minute. Um, I still go back to this sometimes. I This talks about raising poultry for fun or profit, and I think that needs to be um, explored. Why are you doing it? Uh, for us initially, obviously we were starting out and we had seven free birds and we wanted eggs. Um, now it's turned into a whole lot of other stuff because we've started incubating eggs. We've started, um, I don't wanna say selling birds, but people are coming, uh, when we hatch eggs, people will come and get our, our birds and we'll trade and barter and stuff like that. Um, because different, different friends around here offer different things. And so that's what we do. So it has helped me from the beginning of starting out with seven little pullets to now incubating, hatching our own eggs, um, breeding our chickens so that we get, you know, full bred, whatever type of chickens we want. There's a lot of information in there. Solid resource. Then Michelle, I want to say it's marine. It's spelled marine, but it could be said differently. Uh, how to raise chickens for meat. And this was the rabbit hole that I went down. <laughs> so we started out with the pullets and I said, I only want chickens for eggs. And then we started talking about what happens when those chickens stop laying eggs. And 
I did not think that I would ever be able to process a bird because I love them so much. And then we were, we were met with the other question of what do you do when you have a chicken that is injured? I am not going to the vet with my chicken to have them put my chicken down that has been injured. So learning how to humanely take a life. Um, and I'm not here to argue with anybody about what that looks like. There is a way to do it that is best for your bird or your animal. And this just really was extremely helpful eye-opening for me. It, it brought on more questions, made me do a little more research, dive down some more rabbit holes, uh, look into some other uh, homesteaders. How are you doing this? What are you using? What I found out for us is we usually raise 20 to 30 birds at a time. I have a group of friends come over. Sometimes I'll teach classes. People will come and learn how to do their own birds, how to process their own birds. We talk a lot about the difference between heritage breed and, um, and these hybrids. Um, but we also talk about in the difference in feed and the difference in how they grow and the timing for processing. And um, I, I, I found this book to be really helpful, but I also, the experience in and of itself has been really helpful. And then this different breeds, I'm so glad that she talks about it because I started out with the Cornish Cross and I just feel like they're okay. They definitely utilize the food and they grow quickly and it's fast food for us and I definitely can fill my freezer. However, um, eh, we could get better flavor. Um, I would like something that forages a little bit better. I'd also like something I can breed here at our farm. I'm tired of ordering chickens. So this was a good jumping off point for me. And then it led into more and more questions and more and more seeking of information. And there's a lot of really great people out there. Again, Joel Salatin has a book on, um, poultry. I think it's pasture raised poultry. Um, and that is one of, one of my favorite books. Again, it's very intense, lots of information. I don't, I don't raise the poultry to sell. I know that that can be harder on the smaller, uh, farm or the smaller homestead, but for us, it feeds our family and it feeds some of our friends and our friends come out and they learn a skill and they get to go home with their own birds. And so that has been really great for us. And then when my chickens, my layers, when they get to the end of their laying life and they're at that point just eating all the food but not doing anything and they can feed our family by being soup chickens, then I know how to do that. So I've had to learn a big skill in the last two years <laughs> with these meat birds, but this has been a really, really helpful resource for me. The Milk Cow Kitchen. So in 2021, my husband took me three hours away to Weatherford, Texas, and we picked up our first milk cow. She was, we thought, yeah, she was four months bred, um, full, full blood Jersey, bred to a Jersey bull. And, um, I bought this book mostly because I like her name. It's Mary Jane Butters. And I love whimsical, beautiful stories. I love the way she shares her story. I don't know if you can see all the pictures on here. Her cowgirl romance, that had me. Um, she had 15 step-by-step -step cheese recipes. Um, I have not even ventured down all of these recipes because we are <laughs> trying to figure out what to do with all this milk. Um, and I don't know that I have as much time as I thought I would have to make cheese just yet. Uh, backyard cow keeping. And she shares stories of other people, and I really appreciate that because sometimes we need to see what other people are doing. And then 75 Farm Style Recipes. I always love a good recipe book and a good book in general. Um, she shares her story, and she shares the ups and downs. She talks about hard things. I appreciate anyone who is going to start talking to you about, oh, you want to get a, oh, you want to get a dairy cow. You want to get a really large animal. What are you going to do? when it's time for that animal to die because you most likely will outlive that animal. And as hard of a conversation as that is, I appreciate it because I would not have thought about that. I think about the right now and I'm going to get a cow and she's going to have a calf and I'm going to have milk and we're going to have all the yogurt, ice cream, cheese, whatever that we want. And I didn't think about the fact that at the end of that animal's life, I have to make some choices and I have to have a plan. So again, we want solid resources. We want people that are going to be absolutely honest with us about our 
our dream about things to look forward to, things to plan for, things to um, account for. So even though it's absolutely whimsical, I appreciate her honesty in this book. And she is a fantastic author as well. And you can't help but kind of float through her book a little bit happy. Keeping a Family Cow. This book came highly recommended over and over and over again in our milk cow community, um, especially our online milk cow community. And again, for both of these, they talk about dairy farm. Like if you're running a home dairy and that kind of thing, I'm not, I'm, I'm milking for my family. And so always take into account, again, I've said this over and over again, take into account what is your purpose in that in that moment, what is your purpose? What are you working towards? If you are working towards feeding your family, you may do things a little differently than if you are working towards running a small family dairy. Miss Groman passed away this last year. I love the way that she speaks. I felt like she was talking directly to me. Um, as I'm reading this book, like I just felt like we were having a conversation. Um, this is an older book. When did her first book come out? I'm always curious about these things. Of course, I'm curious when I'm in the middle of talking to people. Uh, first published as The Cow Economy in 1975 with uh, Meryl Groman and as Keeping a Family Cow by Joanne S. Groman in 1981. So just keep in mind. That's how long this book is. Um, has been around. That's how long this information has been around. She has a lot of really great things. We forget that the way that our, the way that the people, the families and that those that went before us, we forget so much of what they did was simple and basic and we didn't need all the stuff. And um, we've learned a lot since then. We've learned a lot about how to keep the milk safe and cool and how to prevent infection, things to check for. But this book overall, this is her most recent uh, revised and updated edition. I would recommend this. And the reason I recommend both of those is you have two very different perspectives, two very different types of books that are written very differently. Um, but two people who absolutely love their milk cows and love what their cow has provided for them. Our milk cow is the hardest working animal on our farm. So having that kind of support and then having a community of support, there are not a lot of people in my town that have milk cows. We do have a few actually small family dairies, but not people that have a family milk cow per se. And so what I would say to you is finding these resources is invaluable. Finding resources with people online and not all of them are going to be helpful. Some people are absolutely horrible, but you will find a few people where you go, that makes sense, or this person gets it. And those are the people that I would almost attached to <laughs> like latch on to them ask them lots of questions get lots of information pick people's brain find people find these small dairy farms especially the farmers have been around forever my favorite people are people when we start talking about having a milk cow and they say we had a milk cow when I was growing up and we did this and we did this and we did this some of that information you know that was what they did and maybe that didn't didn't work but it's still really great to get that information. A lot of them can help you when it's time to go buy or purchase your cow, when it's time to bring your cow home, to make sure that you're getting a cow that's going to do what your family needs for it to do. Um, one thing that I don't know that they address in these books that I think is also really important for us, we just have a family milk cow. She gives me one to two gallons of milk a day right now. I'm once a day milking. She's bred. Um, when she had her calf, we were calf sharing. So we did things a specific way. Find people that are doing it differently. Find people that are doing things different ways so that you can ask the right questions and that you can figure out what's gonna work for you. It was not going to work for me to not calf share. I have no other children or husband at home that milk my cow. In fact, I went away for a five day conference last month and I was afraid that my cow was going to be a mess or she was going to dry up and um, all I can say is, by the grace of God, I had a friend that came over and tried to milk her out, but we also were able to put one of our calves on her, and that calf did suckle for a few of those days, and I am still getting the same amount of milk now as I was before I left. Um, it wouldn't have been the end of the world, but I really am hoping to keep her in milk till March, and it's only October. So having resources, not just books, 
Oh my goodness. Yes. That would be really important. Thank you guys for joining me today and all of my books and my mini conversations. I hope that this was helpful. I'm definitely available to answer questions or thoughts on certain things. I really enjoyed spending time with you today. Thank you.